So we will finish this uh, very rich day with two presentations. And uh, Robin Rice will talk about an example of implementation uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much, Robin. So can people hear me? I've got my speaker on. OK. Uh, yeah, so I'm giving an example of how we do research data management at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a data librarian there. Uh, before I went there, I was a data librarian at the University of Wisconsin in the US, which um, might explain my American accent, why I'm not speaking with a Scottish brogue, as you would like. <laughs> um, so I'm based with Adina and Data Library, uh, which is part of the information services there. And um, the data library team is a small group of us who um, are helping provide data support for the University of Edinburgh. And Adina is a, a national center uh, working with JISC for um, service delivery and digital library expertise. So, uh, this is what I'm going to cover, a bit about why Edinburgh has gotten where it is, um, and data-driven science and aspects that have gotten us to where we are. A little bit about the policy that uh, we passed for research data management in May 2011, which uh, we believe was the first UK uh, university policy uh, that, that got passed, and then whole bunch of others followed suit. Um, and then implementing the policy where, is where we're at now. Uh, since 2012, we've had a roadmap uh, where we set out our high-level project plan that's um, available on the website and um, is quite transparent. And we have a governance committee trying to keep us on track, making sure that what we're doing is uh, of use to our researchers. And um, a bit about our training. Many of you came over to our stand and looked at our mantra training course. So I'll just say a little bit about that. And if you're interested in that, I still have some leaflets that I don't need to take back in my suitcase up at the table here at the end. Um, and since this is an open data event, I thought I'd try to share some uh, reflections about the challenges of providing support for open data to researchers. So uh, I guess the University of Edinburgh has a long and illustrious history in this area. For example, we have the School of Informatics, which is a, um, a very high-ranking uh, computer science and uh, you know, informatics department. Um, it was formed in 1998, but that more reflects the university's reorganization where it developed colleges, three colleges, and I think 22 schools, or 21 schools. Um, and it had uh, pieces of it that came before. The artificial intelligence unit uh, is, is very long-standing and well-known. And then there's the EPCC, which I think it used to be called Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center, and it's dropped the acronym. So um, it's just EPCC. Um, but they, they provide a lot of supercomputing infrastructure for the UK. Uh, Hector, and now currently Archer, is the new, the new funded infrastructure. And RDF, uh, I couldn't fit it on the slide, but it's a, it's a new facility called Research Data Facility, which is supposed to provide a lot of um, storage for, uh, I think, people receiving EPSRC-funded grants, which is a research council in the UK. Uh, we have information services, which also came about when the library and computing service merged. Uh, I didn't quite figure out the year sometime in uh, the early 2000s. But then we had the computing service before that, which um, has always been um, quite substantial. I, I heard one time that it was the largest computing service in Europe, so I don't know if that's still true. Um, and they have, they had until recently, uh, until we came up with our new, new plan, that 
or maybe it still exists, the Edinburgh Compute and Data Facility, ECDF. So that's providing uh, high performance computing to the researchers at Edinburgh. And where I work is in the data library. And Adina has, is also, it's Adina and, and the data library together as part of information services. Um, so we pr we've been providing support to, uh, especially for people who want to reuse data for analysis. So we have a strong data, we've always had that strong data support since 1984, um, which was formed in order to um, make available the UK population censuses to the social science researchers. And we have, we've had the National E-Science Center and E-Science Center hosted at Edinburgh uh, over that past decade, and that brought a lot of expertise in grid computing and um, state-of-the-art science projects. And out of that, out of many of those groups above, was probably the reason we got the Digital Curation Center based at Edinburgh in 2004. Um, and they work with JISC also, and uh, they, they have a couple of other sites, but it's sort of headquartered at Edinburgh. And since 2012, we've had the RDM program, Research Data Management, um, which has largely been led by the information services, so it's a support staff-led program, but we have governance um, that's academic-led, and we have uh, Professor Peter Clark leading our steering group who's a um, particle physics professor experienced with CERN and um, very large storage infrastructure. And the Edinburgh Data Science Initiative is something very new. It hasn't even been launched yet, but we're all keeping a close eye on it to see what happens with it. So far, it, it has no funding, but it has the backing of our principal. And there seems to be a desire to get all of the disciplines doing uh, data-driven research in the ways that are appropriate to them, often, oops, uh, often working, collaborating with people in the School of Informatics to help set them up. <coughs> so drivers for our policy might coincide with drive, uh, drivers for other people's policies, except that it happened a couple years ago. Um, and I like I like to always remind ourselves that that OECD document was quite seminal, which um, really established the principle that publicly funded research, I think an earlier speaker said it's a public good, uh, publicly funded research should be made available publicly uh, when at all possible. And 2004 is there because there was a, a previous document, a ministerial declaration, pretty much saying the same thing all the way back then. Um, so we had a research computing survey that we did in 2007 where we asked the researchers what they, what they needed for our, in developing the research computing strategy. And the reason I have it there is there was an overwhelming response that they needed storage space. And uh, we weren't providing enough on the little personal drives that they could connect to for backed up networked storage. And um, just in case you think Edinburgh is doing everything right, you'll, you'll note the date and how long it took us to actually get to the point where we <laughs> rolled out a half a terabyte of storage per researcher just this year. Um, but we did get there in the end. And now maybe half a terabyte isn't even enough, but we can, we can grow that as we go. Um, this is something I was involved in. It's a methodology that the Digital Curation Center developed um, and we just call it DAF, but uh, we kind of changed the name because audit seemed to be too ambitious of a word. To audit an entire institution's data assets was really too much for one project. It might be too much for anyone any t for all time. Well, I don't know if anyone's ever going to be able to do it, but. So we call it a data asset framework, where you at least have a methodology for uncovering the data assets that need to be preserved at your institution or in your school or department. So I could recommend that methodology along with some others that the DCC website can point you towards if you're trying to sit, uh, start something up at your institution. 
And then we had some things we could point to, like um, the university had adopted this um, research integrity office's code of practice of research, which says certain things that imply good data management, like um, data that is underlying research results will be retained. Um, and then the UK funders, you've already heard today, uh, in various places are, are a very important driver. Um, the in our institution would never consider coming up with a data management policy if it, if it didn't know that it was going to be um, supporting what the UK funders were requiring of the researchers. And of course, the publishers are also requiring that data be made available um, more and more often uh, underlying research results, but they don't often have a repository to put it in or they expect the researcher and the institution to come up with that, which we actually think is, is proper um, because publishers go in and out of business and it's hard enough keeping the journals uh, preserved, never mind uh, if the data sets were there too. Um, ClimateGate was mentioned earlier, which was funny, I didn't think anyone else would mention it, but uh, my context is, there was the email review, where there was different kinds of fallout, but in this case, this made uh, UK institutions realize that they, their reputation was at stake if their researchers did not properly answer FOI requests, uh, freedom of information requests, including um, access to data, data sets. So that really at least made um, the senior people at our institution pick up their ears and say, well, maybe we, maybe we should do something. Um, and then this is a driver that happened after our policy, but it affected a lot of other institutions. Um, the EPSRC published expectations about what institutions would provide all their researchers, and that was the first time the, a UK research funder made it the institution's business to solve the problem instead of making requirements of individual researchers. So rather than put up our whole policy, it's not very long, it's only 10 bullet points, it's very principle oriented. Um, but this is a wordle uh, controlling for the words research and data. And you can see it's, you maybe can see it's kind of a soft policy, maybe because it was early on or maybe just because it came from information services and as support people, we don't really want to be telling academics what to do, we want to be supporting them. So things like um, ap appropriate, deposit when appropriate, uh, for future use, um, there should be retention of data, there should be data management plans, um, emphasis on access and making it available and repositories. Um, so this is what I tend, these are the points I tend to point to when I talk about how the policy affects our understanding of open data. Um, it, it does say that the research data of future historical interest and anything that sub substantiates research findings will be offered for deposit in some repository. Uh, and it, it could be our, the one we've set up in the university, or it could be um, sometimes a more appropriate discipline-specific repository. And then the, the important thing here is that the university is saying what it needs to do to fill its part of the bargain um, and provide these, these kinds of st services for storage and backup and registration of data sets. Um, and, and that yeah, registration, the idea that even if the data leaves the university, we should be able to keep a record of what data was produced at the university and, and where it's located. Um, so if you're thinking about a policy for your institution, these are the, these are the kinds of things uh, I identified at the time that needed to go into it. Um, so who's going to provide the support? That's not always very clear. Not everyone, not every institution has a data library, or um, it sometimes falls between the cracks of the librarians and the IT staff. And 
what is the principal investigator responsible for and what is the university responsible for? Um, who has rights in the data? Is the, universe, is the institution asserting ownership? Or you know, what exactly is going on there? And uh, what about the, the departments and the colleges at the sub-university level? What responsibilities do they have to produce guidelines, et cetera? And what about students? In, in our case, um, we have training and we have storage for postgraduate students, but we don't uh, require that, that they deposit their data. Um, so, if, uh, not too many people showed a picture of a data life cycle today, so that's a simple one. Um, the idea being with the life cycle that the researcher starts here and goes around the circle in the data set may live to go around again in somebody else's research project. Um, and these are the activities that need to be supported and that the researchers need to be worrying about. So thinking about those activities and that life cycle, this is kind of our, how it maps onto our roadmap with the early stages here in the planning phase, um, going right through to the active data storage and the the infrastructure needed while the research is active, and then the data stewardship, what happens to the data after the project's completed, and what kinds of support need to underline all those processes right across so that researchers can find the help they need when they need it. And this is the current landing page for the Research Data Management Program, and it almost mirrors exactly the planning and the active data infrastructure and the data stewardship with our repository. Um, that's either out of pure genius or lack of imagination, I'm not sure which. Uh, and then, you know, s some information about why it's important and training with links to mentor. And how to get help and support. And we encourage them to use the information services helpline and hope that it follows through to the people who can help them. <laughs> Uh, so just breaking that down a little bit more, the data management planning before the research data are collected and um, to do this well we need to have good coordination with our research office, uh, which we're still working on. Uh, it would be nice to know, it would be nice um, for the RDM people to know what is being put in all the data management plans, for all the researchers to know they can get support with their data management plans when it's time to write it. But it's a very large university and we're still kind of connecting the dots. And all of these other people can play a role as well. Um, the active data infrastructure, as I said, it's, it's a half a terabyte per, per researcher and they can pool that together into research groups and they can purchase more if, uh, if they need more for a research grant and they can cost that into their grant. But that's what they get for free. Um, we're also, we've also got a an own cloud implementation uh, that gives them more Dropbox-like uh, connectivity to the files and the ability to collaborate. And um, we, want, we would like to have a long-term vault area where people can store their golden copies of the data after they're done, regardless of the sharing status, but for just long-term retention. But we haven't built that yet. And the data stewardship, um, that's either helping people find an appropriate repository or being that appropriate repository, uh, guiding them through the process of documenting their data for reuse, creating metadata records, and minting DOIs now. We're just beginning that um, so that every data set can have a unique identifier that can be cited and understood by other researchers. Um, and this is a screenshot of our repository. Uh, we actually want to do some work on the user interface, so I'm not showing off the, uh, the end user interface so much as just kind of what's there. We have our research communities listed here, um, latest items, or you can get them all in an RSS feed. We have a spotlight area where just show off a recent data set. 
especially if it has a nice picture. Um, and especially for the librarians in the audience, we have a lot of support documents. We have a checklist for deposit. If you're going to do something like this, you want to give a lot of guidance, self-help, um, things that help the researcher think through uh, future proofing their data, documenting it, um, what formats are they going to save it in. The more we can get the researchers to think about those things, the less curation we have to do. Um, and then uh, things about licensing your data with an open license and what, a lot of people don't know about that, so le learning for the first time. Um, I thought I'd just show, because I had to present this to our steering group, so I thought I'd tell you where we're at with the repository. It's, it's been around a little while because we started it up in a, in a um, project back in um, to, uh, 2007 to 2009, and then, the, so we were fooling around with the idea, and then we kind of got serious with this instance that started in August 2010, and you can kind of tell we weren't doing a lot, we were actually working on Mantra that year, <laughs> um, and then we had the roadmap, when the roadmap came into effect in January 2012, then it started going up. This is just usage, people looking at the repository, but it does reflect there's more in there for people to look at, so it's... I'm just glad to see there's some growth. Uh, I don't know if this is successful, you know, if these numbers represent success. It's, um, it still feels like an early adopter kind of thing. Um, 162 items, 111, 111 gigabytes, that's not a lot. I forgot to turn off my phone. That's not very good. It'll stop, right? I did think of it at one point. I left my phone on. <coughs> and then I brought it over here. So data support, just uh, everything else. So it, um, the library is stepping up to giving support and we've, um, we've worked with the, the librarians. Uh, they've hired a research data management coordinator and, an out, and a training person, training and outreach person. Uh, who are, so they're the full-time kind of staff, and then the whole data library team also has been given a boost by the research data management funding, so we're very grateful for that. We have a little bit bigger team because of it, um, but we also can give specialized support in um, data collection, data analysis. Uh, we would like to give some more support in data visualization. And uh, research data mantra, probably most of you have heard of it by now. Um, it's online, and how am I doing for time? I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> okay, probably all right. Keep, I'll be done pretty soon. So uh, we've got video stories, we've got quizzes, interactive quizzes, um, data handling exercises in things like SPSS and R, and uh, we've just released a new version, so we're feeling pretty good about it. I think it's pretty up to date has all the relevant topics like big data and uh, Creative Commons 4. We've done some training of our, uh, with our librarians, of our librarians, um, co-facilitated with uh, one of the academic service librarians. Um, and so we use Mantra, but then we also do face-to-face -face, uh, group exercises and discussion so that librarians can start thinking out loud about what, how they need to prepare themselves to support researchers. And then they, hopefully, uh, it's kind of voluntary, but they go off and interview a researcher and create a data curation profile. And what the feedback there is that it's really helpful for those librarians who've done that to, um, to do that and follow through and interview the researcher. And they find it a rewarding experience, even though they might have some trepidation in the beginning about talking to researchers about their data. So this gives us a bit of a benchmark with other UK institutions. Um, although it's heavily weighted towards the research institutions, it's all of the Russell Group um, institutions and, and some others. This is a DCC survey from this year. And they're really, things are coming along. We've got you know, up to half and more doing all of these activities in research data management. So 
Um, you know, probably none of us have good measures of success yet, but at least there's activity going on. Uh, so this is my reflective slide. Um, I, I think this, it can be quite difficult knowing how, unless without the full-time outreach person who is tirelessly goes around to the schools and says, don't you want us to come give a seminar? Don't you want us to give a class? Uh, how do you reach people? When the, the researchers are busy, they don't really want to hear about research data management until they need to write that proposal, and then they have no time to take a training. They just want some help with the plan. So all of those timing issues are quite key, and they can be kind of problematic. Um, <coughs> I think <coughs> I kind of alluded to this issue of we have this one help desk email People can send in all of their library and computing questions in there, and are they getting rooted to the people who can really help them with a quite a tricky or deep-seated research data management problem? Not sure we know the answer. Um, costing is continues to be a problem. We've offered this free storage, but we do want to get that money back at least through the indirect of grants, um, or perhaps directly. And then getting the balance right for private and open data. Um, I think some of the discussion we heard earlier today, researchers have a lot of angst about just being told you should make your data open. I mean, it is, it is quite complex. There's, they have a lot of files. Which ones are they supposed to share? Which ones are going to be most useful to other people? Not necessarily in their own communities. It might be an interdisciplinary or a citizen science user who finds the data and uh, needs to be able to make sense of it. So how do we incentivize sharing? If we provide this long-term vault with a golden copy that lets them keep a private copy, how do we incentivize them to also um, make that available in the data, open data repository? And I think uh, <clears throat> for librarians, this is, this is a big challenge uh, these days, getting past working with publications and published material and rolling up sleeves and getting hands, data, getting hands dirty with data, as we say, and um, working with researchers at, at, a, at a part that is a little bit less finished in the research cycle. And uh, this is the last slide, just another um, benchmark from the DCC survey. And that these are the obstacles that other peop that people um, answering that survey felt about implementing services and uh, the difficulties that they have in implementing those services. So I'll just end there. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation of a quite complete uh, project, institutional project on data management. Are there some questions for Robin Rice? A lot to learn from. No? A little bit tired. At it's the been a long day. day. <laughs> exactly. So, if I understand right, your um, uh, repository that you showed is a different repository from the publication repository. Um, yes, in our case. Is that, it is. you know, was that part of, was that like a conscious decision or was the use of the existing publication repository, was that an option too, that you discarded and you favored a separate data repository, and for which reasons? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was, it, you could almost say it sort of uh, came about by accident. It, uh, we in the data library were the ones interested in the question of whether institutional repositories could be used for for data sets, and so we built our own, where we had our own developer and um, access instead of, uh, but we did use DSpace, because at that time, 
the publications repository of the university that the library ran was in DSpace, and now they've switched over to a Chris. Um, they use Pure, and which is a so instead of open source, it's a, a commercial product. And I've, I think some people are starting to experiment with using Pure um, or other um, all, all sorts of things for taking in data. So what what happened was we envisaged a project. We, we got a project um, funded by a JISC program in enhancing repositories. And at most people were, in all the other projects were about publication repositories or maybe learning objects. We we're the only ones interested in data sets at that time in repositories. But we got a group of institutions that, where we worked with the institutional repository managers and data librarians. So it was Edinburgh, Oxford, and Southampton. And we, we did a, demonstrator in DSpace, Fedora, and ePrints. Just as a proof of concept that yes, it can be done and we can take data in repositories, but those were early days and it was before, um, it was before people were looking to libraries for solutions about research data, so it was sort of, uh, it was interesting to see the questions that came about of should libraries even be doing this? And, and also because people are attached to their disciplinary repositories. So thank you very much to um, Robin.